Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I'm going to tell you what I think are the five most promising anti-aging compounds that I will definitely be keeping my eye on. So I'll tell you not only what they are and what their thoughts are do in terms of their anti-aging properties, but also why I think they're promising. But before we jump straight into it, there are just a few important things I want to say first. Firstly, just a disclaimer, these are not recommendations, these are just my opinions based on the current evidence we have. And as I'll reiterate at the end of this video, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to try and understand the long-term effects of these different compounds in terms of not only their efficacy, but also their safety, especially in terms of the dose. And more on from that, these are just five compounds out of the more than 200 compounds that have now been classified as jury protectors. And even as I was making this video, my mind did change as to which ones I was going to include. And as a bonus, I did actually include two more at the end of this video. But my point is, is that there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. And I'm certain that you as well may agree or disagree with the five that I'm going to mention here. And so if you have a different top five, then put them in the comments. It'd be great to, to see what people have as their five most promising. And so the thing is, is that my top five could also change over time. And so I guess if it does significantly, depending on what research comes out, then I could always update this top five in future videos. So you want to subscribe so you don't miss that. Anyway, if you do find this video interesting, then I'm certain you're going to like the resource that you can find on the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation's website, whereby they have a rejuvenation roadmap that basically shows you quite nicely where different jury protective agents are at in terms of their clinical process. And I guess the last thing that I want to briefly mention before I begin is why is it so important to understand these different anti-aging compounds? Well, by 2050, the number of people over 60 is expected to reach 2 billion worldwide, roughly 22% of the population, whilst in 2015, it was only 12% of the population. However, whilst there is a trend of increasing lifespan, there's also a trend of increasing years spent with chronic diseases. This includes age-associated diseases such as diabetes, cancer and Alzheimer's disease. One way of dealing with this is to treat these different diseases separately. This places a big burden on the healthcare sector. An alternative strategy would be to target the ageing process itself and alleviate the chances of developing multiple morbidities. So the five compounds that I'm going to tell you about, I've chosen based on what potential I think they have in terms of improving health span instead of lifespan. However, by improving health span, there may also be benefits of increasing lifespan as well. And this is why I particularly like Leaf's rejuvenation roadmap because they split up these different compounds in terms of their effect by looking at which different hallmarks of aging they're most likely to have an impact on. So in no particular order, here are my top five most promising anti-aging compounds. So the first compound is alpha-ketoglutrate. Alpha-ketoglutrate, otherwise referred to as AKG, is a really important metabolite found within your cells, playing a key role in the Krebs cycle. This is essential for the oxidation of fatty acids, amino acids and glucose to generate ATP that is the energy source of your cells. But AKG can also act as a cofactor for different enzymes, including prolyl-4-hydroxylase, which is used to generate 4-hydroxyproline that's important for the synthesis of collagen. And AKG also plays an important role in detoxifying ammonia. Now, I first spoke about AKG earlier this year when a cell metabolism paper showed that AKG, when delivered as a calcium salt, extended health span in both male and female mice and also extended lifespan in middle-aged female mice. Now, measuring health span is notoriously quite challenging to do. And the way that they measured this in this study was by using a clinically relevant frailty index that assesses 31 different phenotypes. This includes visual factors such as loss of fur colour, as well as physical factors such as tail stiffening. In addition to looking at their breathing rates and, for example, whether or not there's any hearing loss or visual loss. And one of the most striking features that they found in the study, as I mentioned in my previous video, was the changes seen in their fur when the mice were treated with AKG. And they also found in the study that AKG didn't reduce the number of senescent cells, but it reduced the inflammatory secretion of the senescent cells. For example, you can see a reduction in interleukin-6 in the blood plasma. So given that AKG treatment impinges on some of the different hallmarks of aging, such as cellular senescence and intracellular signaling and metabolism, 
as well as the fact that AKG is generally recognised as safe, I think that AKG is a promising potential anti-aging supplement. Moreover, I more recently mentioned a study whereby AKG ameliorated age-related osteoporosis via regulating histone methylations. And so given that looking at epigenetic modifications seems to be one of the better ways of being able to determine biological age as an indication of whether or not anti-aging supplements are effective, it will definitely be interesting to see some DNA methylation data in regards to AKG treatment. And another reason why AKG is on my list is because a clinical trial of AKG involving 45 to 65 year olds is currently being planned at the Centre for Healthy Longevity at the National University of Singapore. And this trial will look at the epigenetic clock as well as standard markers of aging, including pulse wave velocity and inflammation among others. And so as said here by Brian Kennedy, this opportunity will allow us to go beyond anecdotal evidence with real clinical data to help inform physicians and consumers to improve health within the context of aging. So that's definitely exciting news. And so I'll be sure to keep you updated as we learn more. Now, next up on my list is metformin. Now, metformin is a medicine used to treat type 2 diabetes, and it can also be used when treating polycystic ovary syndrome. And like with AKG, metformin has been shown in a study to improve both health span and lifespan in mice. Now, metformin has been used for more than 60 years in the treatment of type 2 diabetes, and generally it's been seen to be well tolerated. However, adverse effects have been seen, including diarrhea, nausea, and abdominal pain. In terms of the mechanism of action, again it's slightly similar to AKG in that it impinges on nutrient signalling and metabolic processes. And whilst it isn't fully understood how metformin acts, it is thought that it acts through inhibiting oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, reducing oxidative stress, and also by activating the protein AMP kinase, which suppresses growth signalling pathways, including that of mTOR which sneak preview will be coming back to later. And it also impinges on the insulin response, hence its use in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And interestingly, it's also been shown to influence the microbiome, which may also explain its mechanism of action. And in a video I released earlier this year, there was some in vitro evidence that it could also reduce age-associated inflammation. Now, the main reason that metformin is on my top five list is because of the targeting aging with metformin trial that is a planned six-year clinical trial at 14 leading research institutions across America that will engage over 3,000 individuals between the ages of 65 to 79. And the idea is in this trial they're going to test whether those taking metformin experience delayed development or progression of age-related chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer and dementia. And so this would give us a really good insight into whether or not metformin could actually try and improve health span and reduce the onset of different morbidities. Now, the cool thing with this trial is that they hope the FDA will actually approve aging as an indication to signify that aging can be treated. So that's the idea that drugs can be used to target aging itself as opposed to treating age-related diseases. However, the trial hasn't started yet, but they do have their 14 clinical trial sites committed. And interestingly, they are working on a biomarkers study. But as they state on their website, if this TAME trial is successful and aging is made an indication for treatment, a new era of treatment will be available. So for those reasons, that's definitely why metformin is on my list. Now, next up are nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide precursors. This includes the precursors nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, and nicotinamide riboside, as well as niacin. So these are precursors for NAD+, and NAD+, is a really important cofactor within our cells that has two major functions, firstly acting as a redox coenzyme and alternating between its oxidised and reduced state, and secondly as a substrate for NAD-plus-dependent enzymes, including sirtuins, which we'll also maybe be coming back to later. And I've spoken about NAD plus quite a few times on this channel, and so I'll link down a couple of videos in the description if you want to know a bit more about it. So NAD plus levels have been shown to decline with age, 
and mechanisms that increased levels of NAD plus have been shown to extend lifespan in yeast, worms and mice. But as I said in this video, I was more interested in looking at health span as opposed to just lifespan. So it's interesting to see that in these wealth of studies, NAD plus supplementation has also protected against age associated declines in mitochondrial dysfunction, physical performance, fission and arterial dysfunction, just to name a few. And so you can actually get these precursors from food. For example, NMN can be found in broccoli and avocados, for example. And niacin can be found in tuna and salmon. However, eating these foods wouldn't be enough to match the levels of NAD plus gained in these different animal models. So an alternative way is to take these NAD plus precursors as supplements. Now, unlike with metformin, whereby we have 60 years worth of data looking at the safety of taking it in humans, there isn't as much data to look at the long-term safety of taking different NAD plus precursors, especially in terms of what is the most effective and safe dose to be taking. However, if we go into the rejuvenation roadmap on LEAF's website, we can see that there's clinical trials being conducted using NMN by the Sinclair lab, whereby NMN is currently in human clinical trials at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And nicotinamide riboside has been assessed in human clinical trials conducted by Chromadex, which is a company that has developed a proprietary form of nicotinamide riboside that has been found to be safe by the FDA. So for certain, more studies are needed to really understand whether or not human health span can be extended. However, due to the availability of NAD plus precursors and the high interest in it, in terms of the number of studies being conducted, I thought that NAD plus precursors should make it onto my list. Now, next up is resveratrol, which is another compound that can be found in food, this time in the skin of grapes, blueberries, raspberries, and peanuts. Now, Literally in my last video, I spoke about resveratrol, so I'll probably keep it quite brief here. Anyway, resveratrol has been shown to extend lifespan in yeast, worms, fruit flies, and mice when fed on a high fat diet. And as I mentioned in this video earlier this week, there's some human trial data whereby resveratrol seems to be alleviating the symptoms of heart disease and muscular dystrophy. And the mechanism by which resveratrol is thought to be working is by activating the NAD plus dependent protein SIRT1, which is a sirtuin, which is that family of enzymes I mentioned earlier in this video. And SIRT1, amongst many things, is thought to be able to upregulate stress resistance pathways within a cell, and so plays a key role in the dysregulated nutrient signaling pathways that is one of the hallmarks of aging. And so for these reasons, resveratrol made it into my list. However, I want to emphasize again, as I have done in my previous resveratrol videos, that it seems like there may be dose dependent impacts on the cell in terms of benefit or negative consequences. And so it'd be really important to try and identify what is the safe dose of resveratrol to be taking and to actually have some long-term follow-up studies in human trials. And so the last compound that's made it onto my list is rapamycin that is currently given to patients undergoing transplants as a means of immune suppression to prevent rejection of new organs. So rapamycin has quite an interesting history and there's a lot of data that has shown that rapamycin increases lifespan in several model organisms such as yeast, worms and mice and also delays the onset of many age-related conditions in mice. This is nicely demonstrated in this table here, whereby you can see rapamycin impinges on many different hallmarks of aging, including impaired proteostasis, mitochondrial dysfunction, altered nutrient sensing, stem cell dysfunction, cellular senescence, and impaired intercellular communication. And so it turns out I haven't really spoken about rapamycin before in this channel, but the way that it acts is by inhibiting the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. So the target was named after rapamycin's discovery, hence the name. And mTORC1 as a complex is really important in regulating metabolism and growth within a cell. And so by inhibiting this activity, it reduces signaling through the growth pathways and instead converts signaling more towards stress resistance. And now rapamycin was one of the last minute changes to my list. And although it was one of the first, if not the first, anti-aging compounds that I came across, however, high doses of rapamycin used in transplant patients has been shown to cause side effects, including poor wound healing, elevated blood cholesterol levels, and mouth ulcers. And so one way to circumvent this would be to use a lower dose, although this may also reduce the anti-aging benefits. An alternative strategy, as demonstrated in this 
paper is to have transient rapamycin treatment that was shown here to increase lifespan and health span in middle-aged mice. And another alternative is to use rapamycin analogues that may have higher efficacy and lower side effects. However, this is still much under investigation. But the reason I added it to my list is that there doesn't seem to be any particular reason to write rapamycin off completely yet, given the number of studies that do show potential anti-aging mechanisms. And if you want to learn more about it, there's a really interesting opinion article that I'll link down in the description below that basically details the entire history of rapamycin and all of the studies that have demonstrated the use of rapamycin for longevity. So if you are interested, I'd recommend you check that out. So these are my top five promising anti-aging compounds. And to reiterate what I said earlier, they are only my most promising because there is still much work to be done in terms of finding the right dose in terms of efficacy, but also safety, and also better understanding of the timing of when these different compounds should be taken. And these are just my opinions, not advice. In fact, some of these compounds are not even necessarily available to you at the moment. However, some of them are, and if you are interested, you can get 10% off at do not age.org if you use the discount code SHIGI. But please consult with your doctor and do your own research first. And now, as I said earlier in this video, it was quite hard for me to decide on my top five. And so I've included two bonus compounds as well, just briefly here at the end. The first one is spermidine, which if we go back to that table I showed you earlier, it also seems to impinge on a variety of different hallmarks of aging, similarly to rapamycin. And the second one is fisetin, that has been shown to extend health and lifespan by acting as a senolytic, which is a word used to describe a compound that can kill senescent cells. And there are some human clinical trials being conducted at the Mayo Clinic. And so, I mean, both of these probably could have been included in my top five. So maybe instead I'll do separate videos on these at a future date if there's more research to talk about. But I thought it'd be fun to just kind of pick five because top five sounds pretty good. Anyway, I hope you've learned something in this video and it was somewhat entertaining and interesting. Um, be sure to let me know what your top five are. Obviously, I think that even my own decision could probably be changed in light of more evidence. But yeah, I think, again, going back to my original points, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of really trying to identify the correct and most optimal dose to be taking. As the last thing you want to be doing is taking something that could be more harmful than it is useful. But anyway, on that note, I hope you've learned something. And as always, thanks for listening.